My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on the show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubow. And have you ever wondered how someone went from a full-time employment to managing over 110 million in assets? And we're going to find out on the call that it's actually a lot higher today. Today, my guest, Randy Langenderfer from ARK Invest is, or sorry, from Invest ARK is here to share his secrets from success in the multifamily real estate space. Randy, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Hey, Bryce, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to get to know you and your audience. I'm looking forward to having some fun. Yeah, it should be a good time. So, you know, we're going to spend some time here on multifamily and the multifamily syndication space. Did you start there? Where did you get your grassroots in this real estate game? When was that and how did you get started? My real estate game started, I don't know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, probably. I started out in the uh, single family flip business mm -hmm. and was a hard money lender. And because I, at the time, was working for a private equity company, had an executive position in, in the 08, 09 crisis uh, recession, really yeah. thought I was going to be displaced and figured I needed to find another income stream, something that was going to uh, protect my family and I. So I really started looking, um, started doing hard money lending. I sat with a group in South Florida. I lived in Cleveland, Ohio at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently relocated to Houston, Texas, where I reside today. Uh, went to a couple educational seminars. Invested in my first um, multifamily as a limited partner in 2014. Uh, learned the business, educated myself, investing um, did my first general partnership or lead syndication in 2018. Fast forward to today, that number, as you said, has increased. I'm in, uh, as a general partner, about 1,500 doors today and about uh, 350 million assets under management. So I um, left the corporate world about a year ago to do this full time. That was part of my choreographing my exit um, 10 years ago to say at X date. I want to leave and I want to have this kind of income to support it. Mm -hmm. So I, I very consciously and very diligently uh, work towards that and uh, had the blessings of my wife to do so. And just a pleasure to be with you today, Bryce. Well, yeah, you, you hit on a couple of things there. Uh, the first one was you're flipping in 08, 09 or before it that? It was about 10. It started in about 10. About and 10 so what had you transitioning to um, lending oh. in that situation? You mentioned that it wasn't sustainable or it wasn't yeah. like, what had you transitioning to hard money lending and not just continuing flipping property? Yeah. I, I well, one, I had a brother-in-law get me in it and I first um, being, a, I'm a MBA in finance and a CPA. So a pretty conservative guy mm -hmm. he brought me into the space and I said, you're nuts, totally crazy. Uh, but yeah. I gained comfort with it, you know, through education. And, and the bottom line is, is when I uh, came to Houston, I was really excited thinking I would continue that business. But I just found it very difficult to scale and, fi and find any uh, real scalability to it. it. It was just a churning every six weeks, every six months um, versus multifamily. There's a lot of work up front. But once you get one, it's set it and forget it for about three to five years. Mm -hmm. And you get economies of scale, you get much better lending terms. That was the yeah. other one that interested me in multifamily as I was able to get non-recourse loans. Mm -hmm. So as you know, Bryce, I can get a, a multi-million dollar loan on an apartment building easier than I can get a loan on my single family residence because it's yeah. guaranteed by the property. So those are a couple of the indicators. So can you walk us through being a hard money lender and then becoming a general partner? So you're raising money, I guess, in the non multifamily space, or did you just say, you know, forget small houses, I'm going for multifamily? So I was, I wasn't raising capital at the time. I was doing all out of my own checkbook. Okay. Um, my brother-in-law, brother-in-law and I were, we were co-partners and we were funding all the, the hard money flips. 
out of our own pocket. Hadn't learned about other people's money yet. And okay. uh, same well, way when I- You were actually other people's money. You were the one, <laughs> that you were you were the money everyone keeps talking about. Uh, yeah, and at least uh, that's the way it appeared. And, 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 it was, and it was a good experience. But, um, and when I came to Houston, then I, I said I joined um, an educational group and I, I started to learn through them and I invested all my own money to start with too. Mm-hmm. So I, I never really did any capital raising until 2018. Uh, it was purely, I wanted to prove the concept to myself and risk my money and show other people that I had risked my own money and had some successes along the journey. And so I think that helped me get started in the capital raising business in 2018 then. So. And that's when you started uh, raising money as like an LP? As a GP. The first one in 2018 was a GP that I had raised. It was, uh, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers. It was a six and a half. This was what, six years ago now, eight, seven years ago. It was about a $7 million buy. And we raised, I mean, we had to raise, I'm sorry, we had to raise 3 million. Mm -hmm. So it was more than that. Uh, I remember we raised three million. I raised six hundred thousand dollars my first time, and I was uh, I was thinking that was pitiful, uh, but it wasn't. And for the first time, and so um, it's a start and trying to build on to there, and still doing that today, continuing to build on. So, do you you'd mentioned that you've been a limited partner in deals as well? Do you prefer yeah. the limited partnership part, or do you prefer to have your hands in it on the general par- partner side? So I still invest in both today, Bryce. Um, I, I spend most of my energies as a GP, but I have like a self-directed IRA that I invest my my own private money in other people's deals. Mm-hmm. Uh, people that I've known in the business, people that I respect, that I think are really good operators. So I do both. Um, I probably got about 3,000 doors as an LP mm-hmm. and 1,500 as a GP. So I'm committed to the space. I've got um, a whole bunch of my network, net worth, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. uh, committed to this, probably about 40% or so. So I'm I'm all in, as they say. There you go. So let's talk about a little bit, um, what, what would you say some of the biggest challenges you faced when you were transitioning from full-time employment into multifamily syndication? Yeah, I have, uh, as I said, I, I kind of set a very conscious path and a long path. Mm-hmm. Um, I had been fortunate enough to have an executive position making uh, good money for a um, academic medical center in here in Houston, Texas. And I really didn't want to let go of those purse strings until I had a majority of it covered. So I, the biggest thing, the biggest thing is that mindset shift. It's uh, letting go of those purse strings and those perceived golden handcuffs and all that stuff and uh realizing that you can do this and uh it it it's solely mindset in my mind and so mine was a very methodical approach to it Mm -hmm. uh, because i didn't want to just jump and have a twenty five thousand dollar year income Um, yeah but you don't have to do it that way and everybody can everybody's their own comfort level but um set a course and you know so develop a plan and work the plan i guess yeah is it the the one thing I think people might I've been I've been mentoring and, and coaching people since about 2015 and people get excited and quit early and they yeah. end up having to go back to work. So what are some some tips or what went into the preparation of a proper exit? Great question. And I think that answer differs for everybody right? My situation was unique in that I have four kids. Uh, My wife was primarily a stay-at-home wife. She did not have employment. So I needed to really make sure I could cover benefits and that other stuff. Other people, I I run a coaching business too. Uh, You know, if they have a working spouse uh, that can cover some of those benefit stuff and you cover a portion of the income, they can probably jump a whole lot earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, I would really encourage you listening if you're talking about that to make sure you have the support of your significant other, whoever that is, um, because it isn't worth cause resentment and all those things. Like I'm working so hard. Where's the money? You told me there's going to be money and where's the money. So 
you know, I think it's like 80% of divorces are about money. So if, if you're not on the same page um, and you're jumping into it, it could definitely cause some challenges. I had a real good friend here that uh, is a nurse, a critical care nurse, and he he was wanting to quit so badly. And I helped coach him to say, mm, why don't you go part time? And so he could in that job and he went part time. And so in the last year, when things have been kind of rough in the multifamily space, uh, he's really glad that he didn't quit altogether for the very reasons you just said. So you just got to set your own plan and make sure. I mean, I encourage people, you need to have a significant portion of your current income making it before you jump mm -hmm. so that you can live. You don't, you don't want to take a step back in your standard of living. Um, yeah, not if you have a family, you know, like that if you're like a independent person, single person, you know, yeah. you don't have a lot of, sh you know, weight, um, maybe you can make that jump. But if you're, you know, if you're the picnic table supporting the whole family, um, it's probably something that you want to take into consideration is like, how am I going to maintain my level of support while I try to double it up in this new venture? So when you when you look at um building a team you know as a gp you must are, are all your deals national are they local um mm. and then if if they're all over the country what does that look like for managing these multifamily properties or what sort of teams do you have in place to get that done yeah, there's there's different models, as you know. Uh, there are those who build a vertically integrated business and concentrate, mm -hmm. you know, from construction to property management to acquisitions. Excuse me. And um, I have um, led large corporate teams in in, in the corporate world, mm -hmm. and I have zero interest of in doing that again. <laughs> yeah. So, so I have uh, virtual employees. Uh, I have a virtual assistant. I have a virtual guy that's a uh, University of Houston MBA in real estate that does all my underwriting for me, my first plush. And I currently own today in the Sun Belt. So I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, um, Tucson, Houston, and Dallas. To your point, so I'm geographically dispersed. Uh, but I partner with people that got expertise in those areas. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, when I, I wanted to go to Phoenix area pre-COVID and went there and made several exploratory trips, talking to brokers and um, property managers, got politely told that, you know, you're not from Phoenix, uh, Tucson, you don't own here. So kind of good luck. And uh, two years ago, I partnered with a guy there that had a lot of experience. He knew the market. He knew, he knew the head, the property management company already. He had the vendors were off and running and uh, that's going very well. So, I partner with people that have something that I don't have uh, mm -hmm. in those specific markets. First, it's got to be a great deal, something I really can get my head around and sell to my investors. And then two, what's the different skill sets on the team from property management to acquisitions to KPs, um, money raisers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everybody's got a different role. And, then, and you know, Bryce, the numbers are getting so much bigger to buy stuff today. Mm -hmm that it really requires a team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know some very large operators that still are partnering with a lot of people, just if nothing else to raise money because there's so many zeros involved. So. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to touch on what you were saying before was things have changed in the multifamily space with interest rates. I feel like it's been a conversation since interest rates, like, I think interest rates is a, it's obvious in a sense that that's like an indicator of health. So really what's happening is lending from institutional and, and hard money. The ratios are lower. The it's just more challenging. Uh, it used to be that you could go and, you know, maybe not walk into a bank, but for the, for this case in point of the, the, the comment is just like, it used to be easier to get other people's money without raising it. And now it seems like people are going to have to go and do the work. Also, I've heard something to the, to the effect that these, the people take on these projects and they want to like turn them into another 
loan. They want to like, they want to get their expensive money out and they want to turn them into regular loans. And they're even having challenges to do that. So someone in the space, can you kind of give us the temperature um, and the forecast of multifamily today and into the future? Well, there's a lot there to unpack, Bryce. Um, it's but I think the weather forecast is going to be <laughs> rainy or is it going to be sunny? <laughs> Well, I think I think one thing you mentioned in, in many different aspects is there are just uh, everybody is chasing return today, and people have begun to understand, and it's being publicized that multifamily is a great space because people always have to live somewhere. Yeah, I don't have to have an office, or I don't have to have a, a retail strip center or something, but everybody needs a place to live. So it's attracted large institutional investors. I mean, it was just announced BlackRock purchased, I don't know, some large apartment portfolio for a billion or two billion dollars so you got the high-end private equity companies there's a ton of syndicators like myself uh the educational arms large educational arms out there are pumping out many students these days that increase it and so that's um, just increasing a lot of perspective you know and one of the reasons i think everybody's in real estate is because we know the price always goes up yeah so we shouldn't be necessarily surprised at that but i think uh, in terms of the weather forecast, I think uh, I'm I'm a buyer in all markets. Mm. You just buy very differently. So in markets like that, you know, two years ago, nobody bought a multifamily unless it was variable rate debt. Fast forward to today, nobody buys an apartment building with variable rate debt. Well, right. the rare exception. They so. They all learned a lesson. And so that's when I say you buy an altar in all weathers. It's just you buy very differently. You have different criteria. Um, and I think, you know, my my weather forecast is that's not going to change in the near future. Housing demand shortage across the U.S. Um, anywhere, I've heard numbers anywhere from three to eight million units across the U.S. shortage. Now, not all that's multifamily, but that's just as a large indicator. Mm -hmm. People can't. I have millennial children that have great incomes, but they don't have a down payment to buy a house. So you got boomers like me that are wanting to get out of the house and rent someplace to get rid of all the headaches. Mm -hmm. So a lot of paradigms there. So my weather forecast is, is the asset class is good. Uh, it just has to be bought very strategically um, mm -hmm. and very with a very focused plan and make sure you got all your ducks lined up. Yeah, so that kind of that kind of leads me to my next question, which was, um, how do you approach underwriting deals? You know, what key factors, especially with what we were just talking about, do you consider before investing in a property here in 2024? Yeah, and so <clears throat> for your listeners who are may or be new something, you know, the, the the rule of thumb is you gotta you gotta underwrite at least 100 properties to make 10 offers, and maybe that's 200 today. Underwrite 200 to get 10 offers out that you like and comfortable with. But I'm always amazed too at everybody that does what I do say the, the famous, I won't call it lie of life, but they always say I underwrite very conservatively. And uh, that, you know, one man's conservative is another man's liberal um, and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. So you really have, it really has to be buyer beware and dig in and understand. But we try to focus on uh, properties that are, uh, B plus, B minus in age, you know, probably late 90s through the current time, 100 units or more, uh, south, south, uh, southern U.S., uh, growing work where incomes are growing and populations are shifting into the, all those markets from the north. Try to focus on returning to investors um, a 6 to 8% cash on cash return every year and then um, give them hopefully double their money in five years, maybe a 1.9x equity multiplier or 2.0 equity multiplier. And if I can do that, you know, I feel real comfortable mm -hmm. uh, and asking other people for their money. So. Well, and it's, it's interesting because like people might listen to those returns and say, well, why don't I just put it in the stock market? You know, I get, or some fund, someone's offering me, you know, 12% or whatever, but they're, but they're maybe not taking a close look at the asset that's deriving the capital. You know, yes, there are more risky investments that may be offering higher returns, 
are those returns going to materialize? When you look at a 150 unit apartment block down the street, it's not going anywhere. It's going to be there. It has been there. And, you know, to say, you know, I'm sure you get that all the time. So what do you say to someone who says, well, I was hoping for more uh, in perspective against what I can get in the marketplace and other assets? Well, that's fair. That's a real paradigm shift. I know it was for me because I said as a as a financial guy at heart, I grew up with, you know, go to college, get a good job. Um, I got advanced degrees and everybody tells you to diversify your portfolio into um, you know, bonds and stocks, equities and, and bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the traditional model, which that's good. It's helped a lot of people. Uh, but I, I always tell the story of my last employer here in Houston, a large academic medical institution, has a $1.5 billion, that's with a B, dollar endowment fund. And so they had your traditional stocks and equity, equity and bond uh, diversification strategy. Mm -hmm. And about eight, 10 years ago, they started investing in real estate. So today, Upwards of eight to twelve percent of that one point five billion is in commercial real estate for the reasons we just discussed. Because you get favorable tax treatment, mm -hmm. positive cash flow, and forced appreciation. And yeah. the forced appreciation is what, as you know, most people don't understand because it's a it's a business. It's evaluated on how much cash it generates versus the comps next door, like your single family, mm -hmm. and that seldom goes down. And if it does go down, it's short term. So I would argue you get a better return in the, in the commercial real estate business. I don't think you should have 100% of your portfolio in it. But I think a lot of people ought to have 5 to 15% of their portfolio in it just for diversification, balancing, and uh, they're going to get a better return and it's going to be an overall for your whole portfolio better. So one thing that is always common when we're talking about the whole money, other people's money, investing in different products is, you know, there's there's things like Forex trading and crypto and this and that. But transparency is what investors want, because to be in the dark, you know, there's good times, there's bad times. So could you elaborate a little bit with your experience with investor relations, how you maintain that strong communication yeah. with your investors you know that's the difference between this business and a mutual fund right i tell my investors look you know where i live um mm -hmm. i don't want you to come by but <laughs> <laughs> but but you could come by you got my phone number i don't know who runs my mutual fund portfolio out of new york uh, or who runs or how i'd even contact them if i wanted to so one there's a personal touch and so people people invest with me because we've built a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, they see what I've done and they like it and they they buy into the to the story and, and what it has to offer. And I think that's um, the way of a lot of these. So it's a very high relationship entity. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, so, you know, we do the traditional stuff. We, we send out monthly letters on each asset we own and we keep the investors apprised. But I really think what I like to differentiate myself is on how do people communicate with their investors when times or things go wrong? Mm -hmm. And so I have very consciously because it is a personal thing and we've had some debt problems in the last year, nothing gone under yet, but I've been trying to educate my investors all along the way, um, both writing and I, you know, that's an old fashioned tool, pick up the phone and, and call investors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's got to talk at eight o'clock at night for 10 minutes, I don't care. But I think that's greatly appreciated and brings that hands-on touch uh, perspective. So my communication style is try to be very open and transparent, both good and bad. Um, love telling people when they're going to double their money or more than that. Uh, don't like telling people that we're having challenges, but I think that's important mm -hmm. and multiple means to do it. So um, it, it's only, I mean, it's just what mama told us back in the days, right? Tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And well, so it's 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 the easiest thing to remember is the truth. So when you look at when you look at what the business has been doing and the the ups and the downs, when you look at people investing with uh, syndications as limited partners, in your opinion, who's most suited and maybe who isn't 
suited. So if they're listening along and they're thinking, you know, this sounds exciting, I'd be interested in, in getting into a deal as a limited partner. Who's, in your opinion, suited to be an LP and who's maybe not so suited to be in the business of um, being part of these commercial deals? I think um, I think the person that's not suited is, the I, I would say, the young couple that don't own home house, don't own a home yet or have a house and got a young family. And I don't want to take their last fifty thousand dollars. So <clears throat> that's the person I would I've talked to people like that. And I respectfully encourage them to just continue to go the <clears throat> excuse me, the mutual fund route until they get a little more assets saved up. My avatar or the person I'm I'm really attracted trying to focus my message to is that person that is in um, probably their 40s plus uh, and probably in the corporate world has got a few spendable dollars, realizes mm -hmm. they don't want to be in the corporate world forever and was like me trying to plan their exit and they need a little bit boost in their returns mm -hmm. and uh, want to start to consider something alternative. So I think that's the ideal candidate for me, Bryce, is somebody that uh, has gone through a similar path than I did. Yeah, has more than 50K, has some experience probably with investing in different asset classes, is looking at their corporate job and their benefits and what they're doing as far as their pension. Maybe the company is investing it for them and they're looking at it and they're, you know, they're, they're, they hit that mark on 40 and they're looking at 60 going, am I going to be like living in a trailer park? um in like a not warm state am i gonna have to be in like cleveland in a trailer park because i'd like to at least be in florida in a mobile you know double wide so they're looking down the barrel of the gun and they're saying i gotta do something uh to expedite my my trajectory as well as find something that's like a more solid asset you know it's not going anywhere it's yeah. not like a stock you put all your money into a stock and so well, it's, it's, it's Silicon Valley. What's that bank? Silicon, Silicon Valley, Valley Bank. bank. Yeah. <laughs> there. I hope, uh, I hope the stockholders got something back on that collapse. Well, I, the other one is there is, you know, you're, you're 40 and you're saying to yourself, do I really want to do this for the next 20, 25 years? Um, and you're thinking about alternatives and, you know, that's why I started a, a coaching business to really, uh, focus on those types of individuals that, again, were like me, wanting to have another another exit strategy other than wait until you're 65. And, and that's not bad. But um, I just think a lot of people ought to, ought to look at real estate as an, and you can get in it passively. Mm -hmm. You can get all the advantages without having to wheel, deal with tenants, toilets and termites, um, mm -hmm. as they say. Um, and so you don't have to have the active role you can get all the advantages by being a limited partner, which most people don't understand. And that's our job just to try and help them. Yeah. In Canada, we call it just tenants and toilets. We don't have termites out here. So it's just tenants and toilets and maybe the rent board. That's really our challenge is dealing with the, like uh, the rental laws up here. They're very, the rental board, the rentalsmen, I guess you call it. So you don't have termites in Canada. Uh, We've got carpenter ants. That's about as far as it goes. You know, we don't we don't okay. get termite damage on a whole house. You know, we're not getting termite inspections. I don't think it's warm enough. Um, at least the climate change hasn't shifted so that they're up here. But I'm sure they get it in BC and maybe in parts of Ontario around Cleveland and stuff. You know, yeah, where they probably get it a bit, but we don't really deal with the the third T too much now. Here's my favorite question, and, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll take this thing to the finish line. What's your secret sauce? You know, what do you find easy that other people might find difficult to do, or what comes naturally to you that other people might find difficult to do? I, I think what I do fairly well, and what I enjoy doing is is building that relationship and just taking a long term view of people. Mm. Uh, I, people don't understand when I talk to them; I'm not selling them anything right away. I may have an offering in the future they may or may not be interested in, but uh, I, I want to help people understand. So I spend a lot of my time, Bryce, talking with people. I won't even call them investors uh, because right now they're just trying to understand it and get their head around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe they come on board two or three years later, but so many people built into me and my journey mm -hmm. that, you know, I think it's upon all of us to give something back. So uh, that's what I enjoy. 
Nice, nice. So if people want to get connected with you, they want to find out more, what should they do? How do they find you? Well, Bryce, uh, thanks again for letting me be on the show today. Um, there in my um, my email is in the corner there, randy.langender for at invest-ark.com. And my my webpage is that invest-ark.com. Uh, there's a contact us there. Uh, there's also another website, multifamily maestros, all one word, uh, which is where my coaching business is runs. And if anybody wants to really talk about that, I'd love to do that as well. So thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Randy, I really appreciate you stopping by. My pleasure, Bryce. Have a great day. No problem. Until next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now at MoneyPartnerFormula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit MoneyPartnerFormula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.